Hey, welcome to our entire Experience Core Global Online family. Hey, we're so excited to have you with us on today. I want to introduce some amazing ministers that we had with us this past weekend. We wanted to allow you to be able to experience them as well online. It's none other than Ashley and Carly Teredes, all the way from Colorado Springs, Colorado. We're excited to introduce this ministry to you. Hey, lean in, listen in, it's gonna be fantastic. Right? Man, I'm so excited. This is our first time ever in Namibia. Yeah. Pretty excited to be here. And I just know that the Lord has, uh, has brought us here for a reason, for a purpose, uh, to be with you, to impart something that he has for you because he loves you. Amen. amen. Because you are his favorites. Amen. Come on, praise <laughs> the Lord. So you can take, amen, hallelujah. Amen. You can take a seat if you can. Praise God. You know, we're honored to be here. Amen. And um, like Pastor Mike said, we have some new friends now yeah. across the planet. Praise the Lord. And we're we so have, blessed. We have the same dad. We have the same right? father. Look at that. <laughs> praise God. So we're super blessed. And, um, you know, we're blessed to be here, honored to be here, honored to minister here. We don't go to every church. Praise the Lord. But if you're a visitor here, if you're a guest here today, then welcome, welcome. And I encourage you, come back. This is a great church. Amen. And... If it's your home church, you need to thank God every day amen. for giving you such a great home yeah. church, amen. Praise the Lord. I tell people, church alive is worth the drive, amen. Some of you make a yeah. sacrifice to be here. I want to encourage you. This is where you need to be at least once a week, praise the Lord. And I'm so glad you've been honoring your pastors and such a powerful house of God right here. Yes. So we're blessed to be here. Amen, absolutely. Well, we, we've already introduced our team here, Pastor Chipo and Jay. We're so thankful they, they were able to be with us. And they were so kind as to bring some things with them. Yeah. So we do have a table out there. We have a couple of books out there. And, and Pastor Chipo's like, you must tell people about the things. So I have the things, okay? Otherwise, they get in trouble with Pastor Chipo. But this is um, our Ashley's book. It's quite offensive. God quite wants offensive. you rich. It's quite offensive. He does. The he Lord wants told you me rich. to write this book. And I was like, Lord, can we... Can we, you know, let, let us reason together. I said, you're gonna upset so many people if we call it this. You know, our spiritual mentor and father, Andrew Womack, about 30 years ago, wrote a book, amen, wrote a book called, called you, you, um, God Wants You Well. Almost forgot the title of the book. Yeah. God Wants You Well. And he got a lot of flack in the body of Christ because he preached that it's God's will to heal every time. And Lord said, I want you to write a book called God Wants You Rich because it's God's will for his children to prosper every time, amen, praise God. So. So I want to give this to somebody that would say, I need some help with my finances. Jay, would you give that to someone? Someone that looks excited. You have to look excited, happy to be here. Okay. And then this, <laughs> and there's more out there if you didn't get one, okay? This one is called Miracles and Healing Made Easy. You know, God wants us well also. Amen. He has miracles. He has healing for us. He is no respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. Amen. And anyone that believes can receive. So this is a powerful book. Lots of testimonies in here from our family no, as well. No, Jay, give that to somebody that needs to, to receive healing in their body. Amen. She's going, she's going. Come on. There we go. I love that. You know. I love that. A couple of testimonies in that book. You know, our daughter Hannah was given one week to live. Uh, 19 years ago, she was given one week to live, praise God, and now she's 100% healed, healthy, not one thing yeah. longer, married, giving us a grandchild. So we've seen this work firsthand. My wife Carly was diagnosed with grand mal seizure epilepsy. She had to take 13 different medications every day of her life. When I married her, she had to have a babysitter. She had so many seizures and so many fits. She was completely healed of that 18 amen. years ago, amen. praise God. So we've seen this firsthand, amen. Amen. So come back tonight if you want to see some miracles, praise God. Well, bring, right. bring your family, bring your friends, bring your enemies. Just bring everyone you can who needs a healing, praise Amen. God. And if we can't fit you in here, we'll just break the roof. And That's Pastor it. Mike won't mind. We'll just lower them down from the roof, praise God. I Lord. would suggest maybe coming early to get a seat. Get, come early yes. get a seat. Amen. That's it. That's it. Awesome. it. And we can squeeze some more people in on the sides or on the floor. We'll, f we'll find room for you. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I'm excited this morning. Um, my husband's going to bring the word, and I know that God has given you something special for the people today. Praise the Lord. And um, I'm, I'm believing for revelation. Yeah. Amen. Are your hearts open to receive revelation? God has something for us today. Amen. Have fun, honey. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Appreciate my wife. She's a blessing. Amen. Come back tonight if you want to hear a good word and you want to see some miracles, praise the Lord. She's anointed in the healing ministry. She's anointed to teach on healing. You're going to be blessed, praise the Lord. So let me pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that we've got hearts open to your word, Lord. Lord, we don't want to hear from Ashley. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want to hear from the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, have your way right now. 
I thank you, Lord Jesus. You're right here in our midst. And I thank you, Lord, that you are ministering to us today. Your word is going forth today and your word does not return void. So right now, Lord, I thank you for, for cutting out distractions. I thank you, Lord, for, for focused minds, hearts ready to receive. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Did you know that everything focuses around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? What Jesus did on the cross was redeem us, and he paid for everything we need. He was so powerful. You know, Jesus really was grace personified. Grace was God's provision, his ability, his unmerited favor to us. And he sent his son down, his only son, to die in our place, to die in your place. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, praise God, you get all the goods. It's the almost too good to be true news. He's powerful. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he made him who knew no sin to be sin. Why? Why did God put sin on Jesus? He put you on my sin on Jesus. He took all the bad things you've ever done, past, present, and future. He took the sins of the world and laid them on Jesus. The guilt, the suffering, the condemnation was put on Jesus. And he died on that cross. Never sinned. He was a perfect man. The only man who's ever walked the earth and never sinned. But he died on that cross being made sin. He took your sin. He took my sin to the cross. And guess what we got in exchange? We got his righteousness. We get his righteousness, praise God. We might be the righteous of God in Christ. We get his righteousness, the great exchange. You know, he took your sickness to the cross. You know, uh, 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes, you were healed. You were healed when Jesus took stripes on his back. Jesus took pain in his body and you became healed. So he took your sin, your sin, he took your sickness, he took your suffering, your pain to the cross. And guess what you get in exchange? You get his righteousness. You get his health and healing, his wholeness, praise the Lord. This is the gospel. This is the almost too good to be true news. You know, the word gospel meant almost too good to be true news. And when they preached it, they're like, man, this is almost too good to be true. I guarantee you come to this church for any length of time, you'll be like, that sounds too good to be true. That's the gospel. That's the gospel, praise the Lord. You know, he took our anxiety, our confusion, our mental torment to the cross. And we get his peace, supernatural peace. We get his supernatural peace. Jesus took things to the cross and we get what he paid for. It's the great exchange. It's a beautiful thing. Would you know it's the same thing with our provision. God provides for you. God provides for his children. And do you know that Jesus took lack and poverty and not enough to the cross? He took those things to the cross so you don't never have to. Some of you are looking concerned about this. Turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, I'm so glad Pastor Mike read 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapters 9 are both financial chapters. Never take a text out of context. If you take a text out of context, what are you left with? A con. So don't take a text out of context. Leave it in its context. And in context, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and chapters 9 are all talking about money, offerings, finances, resources, provision. Right here. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a grace thing. This is an unmerited favor. This is something we don't deserve. This is a grace thing. This is something God provided for us. This is grace in action. As you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet though he was rich, uh-oh, we're in trouble here. You read that in your Bible too? Though he was rich. People say, well, Brother Ashley, you know, Jesus was rich in heaven. Amen. We can all agree on that. But here's a problem we have in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters. We ha we've been portrayed, religion has portrayed that Jesus was just like one up from a homeless person walking around the earth so poor that he couldn't afford to buy anything or do anything, and yet we're told, you know, we want to be just like Jesus. And then you have these crazy teachers coming in with a funny accent from England, living in America. This really froze people. I think this is the devil's plan because the English don't talk about money. So it's really interesting. They chose an English person to talk about finances. I remember the, uh, the first time I ever preached on this continent in Africa, um, the pastor called me the night before and he said, Brother Ashley, and he said, we've got a problem. He said, we've got some protesters. Well, man, I was excited. I was thinking protesters. I was expecting cars upside down on fire, placards, you know, people marching around the church. I thought, this is going to be awesome. So I said, what's going on? He said, well, there's a couple of people on Facebook. I said, well, that's not really that exciting. I said, what are they saying? He said, don't bring this American prosperity gospel teacher to your church. I thought, this is going to be interesting. So I get up on Sunday morning, and I start talking, and you can hear the, the crowd start whispering, like, he's not American. Sounds English. 
So I was like, amen, I'm English, not American, that called me of God. And the first statement I made was, I said, the prosperity gospel is a lie. The pastor was like, woo, let's get him out of there. I thought he was going to come and tackle me. I said, there's only one gospel. There's the gospel of Jesus. There's only one gospel. One of the side effects happens to be prosperity. One of the benefits, Andrew, just like it's healing, just like it's righteousness, just like it's peace of mind, it's prosperity. It's one of the, one of the side effects, amen. But we preach Jesus. And this really is one of the least side effects, but in the body of Christ, so many people haven't embraced it yet. It's because it's been either rejected or neglected. People have seen it abused. Don't raise your hand, but everyone's seen a bad marriage, right? We've all seen bad marriages. Does that mean we give up on marriage? No. Have we seen prosperity abused or neglected or rejected? Yes, we don't give up on the message. It's still the truth. If you don't know the purpose of something, you're not going to use it properly. You're going to abuse it, misuse it, reject it, neglect it. I heard a story of a lady in Europe when the Apple iPads come out. You know, these iPads, I love these. I've got like 100 Bibles on here. It's what I use for my Bible. I love it. Well, she bought her father an iPad and sent it to him. She thought, you know, he could FaceTime and read the newspaper on there and stuff and use it for doing things. So she sent him an iPad for his birthday. And a few months later, she went to visit him. He said, hey, Dad, how would you like your birthday present? He said, oh, honey, he said, I love it. He said, I use it every day. And he was in there in the kitchen chopping carrots on it. <laughs> Put it in the dishwasher. 500 US dollar worth of chopping board, worth of cutting board right there. Why? Because he didn't understand the purpose of it. He never even turned it on. He didn't understand that. We don't have to understand the purpose of prosperity. So Jesus, right here, back to this verse, it says he was rich. Church, I'm telling you, Jesus had money on earth. When he was a toddler, they sent an entourage of people and they gave him gold, so much gold that his dad could stop working and live in Egypt. He got given gold. He had a treasurer. If you have a treasurer, you better have some money. What's the point of having a full-time treasurer with no money, and that treasure was stealing from him. So if you have a treasurer who's stealing from you, you better have more than like 100 rand in there. You better have more than $100 in there. You better have more, I mean, you got a treasurer who's stealing from you. He traveled. You couldn't travel in those days unless you had money. He had 12 teenage boys hanging around him. They're expensive. Feeding 12 men hanging around. You know, he did these, now people say, well, actually, you know, he had nowhere to lay his head. Well, he had a, a, a ministry headquarters in Capernaum. We can read that. He had a house, but he went traveling. You know, me and Carly go traveling. We're 9,000 miles away from home. Sometimes we end up getting stuck in airports or whatever, and there's no way to lay our head. You know, they say, well, Jesus was so poor, he couldn't even afford his own grave. He couldn't afford his own tomb. He had to borrow Joseph's tomb. Well, I don't think that was because he had a lack of money. I think the reason why he borrowed Joseph's tomb was just good stewardship. So if you think about it, he only needed to use the tomb for three days. Why buy it if you're only going to use it for three days? And you, come on, and you can't... You can't rent a tomb. They don't rent tombs. They don't rent graves. It's like a done deal. So he just borrowed a grave. No, here's the fact. Jesus, you know, he rode a brand new vehicle, an unridden colt, a brand new donkey. He had nice things. His clothes were so nice that when he died, they fought over his clothes. You know that? They fought over his clothes. His clothes were so nice. Let me tell you the truth, church. Jesus had money on earth. Jesus had money on earth. Religion has told us he didn't. He had money on earth. Here's what happened. When he went to the cross, he became poor. Just like when he went to the cross, he became sin. Did Jesus ever sin on earth? Not one time. But when he went to the cross, he was made sin. Was Jesus poor on earth? Not one time. But when he went to the cross, he was made poverty on that cross. He was so poor on that cross, he had nothing to his name. You know, the World Health Organization did a study, what's the worst poverty a man could ever experience? And they said the worst poverty a man can ever experience is being thirsty and naked. If you're thirsty and naked, that's the worst poverty. How did Jesus die on the cross for you and me? Thirsty and naked. Let me tell you the truth. Jesus became poor. So we wouldn't have to. Right here, the rest of this verse. He was rich, yet for our sakes. Whose sakes? For your sakes. Just like he made him sin, he made him poor for our sakes. This was how we are going to be redeemed from poverty. This is how we're going to be redeemed from lack. For our sakes, he became poor. Why? So that us, through his poverty, come on, church, through his poverty, Jesus experienced poverty on earth, so we don't have to. Through his poverty, you can be made rich. Now, I know some of you already are thinking, man, that's a strong statement, being made rich. I'm not sure about that, Ashley. I'm not sure about calling it rich. That seems a bit strong to me. You know, I just want to believe for enough money to pay for my bills, look after my kids. That's all I want. I'm not into that prosperity. I don't, I don't want to believe to be rich. I just want to be comfortable. That's selfish. If all you're believing for is looking after your own needs, that's selfish because the purpose of prosperity is so that we can help others and spread the gospel. Turn over one more uh, to the next chapter, and this is the next verse that Pastor Mike was reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 
verse 8. Look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. This is the definition of what God calls rich. You know, Carly and I get the privilege of ministering literally all around the world. We've been to some of the poorest countries in Asia and Central America and Africa. We've seen this work firsthand. The definition, God's definition of rich is right here. It's one of the best definitions you'll find in the Bible of what rich means. It's all relative to different people, right? You could take a, a rich person in one nation, take them to another nation, they'll be poor and vice versa. So right here is God's definition of being rich. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, again, a financial verse. He says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Now, a couple of things here, church. First of all, it says, and God is able. So we're going to have to look at the verse before to understand this. But for now, let's just look at this. And God is able. So that means God is able to provide something for you by grace, but our job is to receive it by faith. You know, Ephesians 2.8 says, you are saved by faith through grace, or by grace, sorry, through faith. That means that God's already provided it. Our job by faith is to say yes. God's provided this for every single believer. It's our job by faith to say, yes, I receive it. That's why not every believer receives it, because not every believer says, yes, Lord. So right here, he says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. This is a grace thing. This is a free gift. That you have in all sufficiency in all things. This is good news, church. This means all your needs met all the time. Who wants all their needs met all the time? I want all my needs met all the time. You know, it's expensive running a ministry. It's expensive spreading the gospel. We have staff in Colorado. We have staff here in uh, Africa. We have to pay them. They want paying like every two weeks. It's amazing. I'm like, I just paid you two weeks ago. They want paying again. And, and then to fly around the world. You can't go to the airlines and just give them a hug. They want money to get on a plane. To go on television, they want money to go on television. We're, we're privileged enough to go on television daily, Faith TV, TBN, Daystar. That costs money to do that. It costs money to do these things. So God is able to make all things, so you have an all sufficiency in all things. That means all your needs met all the time. That means your rent paid, food on the table, clothes on your back, all your needs met all the time. God is El, I'm telling you, he, he's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. He provides for his kids. Amen. He, God provides for his kids. He's Jehovah Jireh. Some people get mixed up with Jehovah Java. No, Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's, he's the all-sufficient one. He's the one who provides. So right here, it shows us that he's going to give us all things, all the time that we need, all our needs met all the time. But it doesn't stop there. Look at this. If it stopped there, it would be selfish. It doesn't just stop there. Look at this. It may have an abundance for every good work. The reason why God wants you to prosper and have extra is so that you can have an abundance for every good work. So you can be givers. So you can spread the gospel. So you can actually get this word out. You can show the world how much God loves them. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, one of my favorite verses. Deuteronomy 8, 18. In fact, I have two favorite verses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8, 18, and then Deuteronomy 28, 8. Deuteronomy 28, 8 says he's going to command a blessing on your storehouses. It's powerful. He's going to command a blessing on your storehouses and all to which you set your hand. Everything you put your hand to, Joe, is going to be blessed. We're talking about increase. We're talking about more than enough. We're talking about supernatural increase. We're talking about abundance. Everything you put your hands is going to be blessed. Deuteronomy 28, 8. That's what he's done. You got commanded, blessed on you. Are we going to believe it? My second favorite verse is this verse I'm going to read now. It's Deuteronomy 8, 18. Sometimes, you know, one, I remember the first book I ever had. Someone gave it to me. I was, I was new to this thing. I didn't know what about books. I mean, I don't know what you do. So they gave me the book and said, would you sign it? I was like, okay. So I just like signed it. That was it. And they looked a little disappointed. And I said, why are you disappointed? They said, well, usually ministers, you know, they put like a little encouraging message in there. They put a Bible verse. They put something. Not, not just sign it. I said, oh, okay. So you want something more than just a signature? I said, okay. So I said, give me that book back. So I got it back there. And I was thinking, well, do I do Deuteronomy 8.18? Or do I do Deuteronomy 28.8? And I was a little nervous. And there was a long line of people waiting for their books to be signed. So I was like, Deuteronomy 8. 18, or Deuteronomy 28.8. I was like, they're both good verses. What should I put in there? Well, I started writing in there Deuteronomy 28.18. Deuteronomy 28.18 is not a good verse. It says you're cursed. Everything you touch is cursed. <laughs> the fruit you is cursed. I wrote that in about the first 10 people. I was like, Deuteronomy 28.18. Be blessed, brother. Deuteronomy 28. <laughs> Can you imagine? They got home. Honey, I just came back from Brother Ash's conference. He's written a scripture for our, our family to live on. Get the kids. Gather them around. Gather around, get around, everyone, quiet. Johnny, get the big Bible, get the family Bible. Let's read this right now. Read it, Deuteronomy, it says here, Deuteronomy 28, 18. What does it say, little Johnny? You are cursed. <laughs> so that's from the verse I'm reading today. The verse I'm reading today is Deuteronomy 8, 18. And Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 says, 
Do not forget the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the power to get wealth. Did you know, church, many of us are praying for prosperity or praying for extra or praying for provision or praying for money so we can be givers, and God does not ask us to pray for money. He's already given us the power to get money. He's given you the power to get wealth. You as a born-again believer today have the power to get wealth. You have it. It's a covenant right. He gives you the power to get wealth. And why is he giving you the power to get wealth? So you can just buy more stuff and enjoy yourself? No. That's okay because he loves you. But the real reason he's giving you the power to get wealth is so that he can establish his covenant, which is what's for your fathers. Meaning this. He wants the church prosperous so that we can spread the gospel. We can tell people how much God loves them. We can see people come into relationship with Jesus. That's why the church should be here. The, the, the church should be wealthy here. That's why, that's why the money should be in the kingdom of God, so we can help more people. People don't, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And one way you can show them how much you care is by providing for them, meeting their needs, helping them, giving. You know, it costs money to have churches. It costs money to do build-outs. It costs money to expand. You give into the church. What happens? It gets expanded. Things happen. God's covenant is settled. You need to believe God to prosper so you can give more to the church, give more to ministries, give more to the, your neighbors, benevolently in all these different ways. And I think most of us, if we're honest, we would want that because we have the nature of God inside of us. And I believe it's Psalms 51 says God is a generous spirit. God is love, right? Uh, uh, 1 John 4, God is love and love always gives. Love is never a taker. Love is a giver and God loves to give. God loved the world that he gave his only son. So he wants us to be givers. He wants us to prosper so that we can be givers. He wants us to prosper so we can be givers. So how do we activate the supernatural overflow in our lives? Because if this is a done deal, if God's promised us supernatural overflow, if God's promised us abundance, if God's promised us as a covenant right that we're going to have enough and extra, we're going to prosper financially right now, right here in this economy, wherever you may live, right here, you can prosper God's way. I've seen this work in like, the poorest nations in the world. I've seen this work in prison cells. I've seen this work with single mums with no money. I've seen this work with, with eld the elderly who retired. I've seen this work in all sorts of situations. I've seen this work every time because the word of God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. The only difference maker is faith. Are you going to believe it or not? See, every Christian is blessed. Every Christian is supernaturally blessed. Proverbs 10, says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. So every Christian is blessed, but there's two types of Christians. There's those who are blessed and choose to believe it by faith and act on it. And there's those who are blessed and choose not to believe it and don't act on it. And if you're right here now thinking, man, I don't want this guy talking about money. We need to talk about spiritual things. I don't want anything to do with this prosperity. Don't worry, it's not going to happen to you. You don't have to worry. It's not just going to sneak up on you. You have to intentionally believe this. And I say, Lord, I believe your word. I believe your promise. Some of us are going to have to repent this morning. I'm going to pray for you in a minute. Some of you are going to have to repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for having a wrong attitude with prosperity. I'm sorry thinking this is an American thing, or I'm sorry thinking this is a TV evangelist thing, or I'm sorry for the times when I've said that's not right. You know who had a real problem with prosperity? One of the disciples. And in John's gospel, he just outs him. I like John's gospel. John's gospel was written later, so John just like names and shames people. And when John names and shames people, and it's type of petty as well, I don't even know this, but like John even put, you know, I outran Peter to the tomb, you know. It's like, what name my book? It's like, the disciple Jesus loved outran Peter to the tomb. Just so we're clear, I was faster than Peter. I mean, come on. You never read that? We need to read the whole Bible, you know that. I mean, you're going to get to heaven and meet these authors. You're going to meet Peter and all these people and Luke and John. You're going to, you know, make sure you've read their books. It's going to be embarrassing. You get to heaven. Hi, what's your name? Obadiah. Did you like my book? Well, <laughs> read the whole Bible. I was embarrassing. But anyway, John names and shames it. And there's an account. We haven't got time to go there for time's sake. But you, you know the story. Mary comes to Jesus with a very costly alabaster jar. And she breaks that jar to worship Jesus. She gives an offering to Jesus. They say it was worth a year's salary. So whatever a year's salary is. Imagine a year's salary. Imagine giving Jesus a year's salary in one offering. She came and gave Jesus one year's salary in one offering. And the whole room was smelled this beautiful aroma and Jesus even said everywhere the gospels preach we're going to talk about this woman because of the generosity she had so she she broke this alabaster jar and spent a year's salary on Jesus and what did the disciples say the disciples were indignant they were mad and you can read this in the other gospels said they were mad they weren't very happy about this but John's gospel he explains it he said it was Judas and there was two Judas right in the uh, disciples so he was very clear it's Judas Iscariot the one who would later betray Jesus. Like, let's be clear here. 
There wasn't the other Judas, the good Judas. I feel bad for the good Judas. He's like, what's your name, Judas? But not Iscariot, honestly. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the one who betrayed Jesus. He's like, anyway, it's like Thomas. He would call him Doubting Thomas. He's like, come on, give me a break. So anyway, he's there, he's there. And Judas says, right there in John's gospel, uh, uh, John says it was Judas who was mad at the offering. And do you know why Judas was mad at Mary's offering to Jesus? It talks about it right there in, in John's gospel. He said he was mad because he wanted the money for himself. He actually said, we could have sold this perfume and given the money to the poor. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, these rich Christians, they shouldn't be doing that. They should give their money to the poor. Listen, I've got friends who are very prosperous, and they give a lot of money to the poor. In fact, one friend, he just got given a brand new truck, and one of his other friends said to him, man, that's not right, you got that brand new truck. He said, you got that brand new truck. He said, you could, have, you could have given that money to the poor. He said, you don't understand. He said, that truck was a gift. I never paid for it. Someone gave me that truck. He said, the reason why I have that truck is because of the amount of money I've been giving to the poor. God will never be outgiven. So it's not about things. God doesn't care about you having things. You can have as much things as you want as long as things don't have you. So Judas had a problem with things. Judas had a problem with covetousness. Judas had a problem with money because he said, he came out all very pious, you know, like, well, we could have sold that and given the money to the poor. How many of you know, most of us would have gone, amen, Judas, that's right. We shouldn't have wasted a year's worth of salary on one offering. We could have sold that and given the money to the poor. It sounds very Christian, we could have given the money to the poor. But John says right there, he says, not that he wanted to give the money to the poor, but he wanted to keep the money himself because he was a thief. And he used to steal what was in the treasury. So the reason why he, he got mad was because he wanted the money for himself. He was jealous. Anytime we criticize someone else's prosperity, we've got to be careful that our hearts aren't jealous. Our hearts aren't covetous towards that. And we can mask it with Christian sayings like, well, we could sell that and give to the poor. Really? Or do you want it for yourselves? I've been there. I've been there. When my, when my neighbor's got a brand new vehicle, and I'm driving my old vehicle, and I drive past his house, the guy's got a brand new vehicle. And then, a few weeks later, he got a second brand new vehicle. And I was like, man, this is not good. Two brand new vehicles. He doesn't need two brand, who can, why does he need two brand new vehicles? One's just sat there on his, on his driveway, two brand new vehicles, this is not right. And finally, my kids called me on it. They said, Dad, are you mad about his vehicle, or are you mad about your vehicle, because your vehicle's old and beaten up and broken down? I was like, oh, yeah, I repent. And I repented, got my heart right with God. It was just a few months later, I got given a brand new vehicle. And guess what? Once I had my brand new vehicle, I didn't care about my neighbor's brand new vehicles no more. <laughs> so we've got to be careful, church. When we see people prosper, when we see our friends and family and neighbors prosper, we've got to be careful we're not coming at that with jealousy and going, man, this, is, you know, this, is, this isn't right. We could give the money to the poor. We don't want to say that. We, that's what Judas said. Judas said this. And you can find this story. I, I've talked about it so much. I thought I'd give you the reference. John 12. It's in John 12. And John 12, 6, he said, Judas said this, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in the money box. Did you know the very next thing Judas did was go straight to the Sanhedrin and say to them, how much money will you give me to sell you Jesus? He was so full of covetousness, he sold his relationship with Jesus and left Jesus for some money. We've got to be very careful, church. Money is a tool, T-O-O-L, money is a tool. And money is never to be worshipped. Money's always to be used. Money's never to be served. You know, money makes a terrible master, but it makes a great servant. We're meant to tell money what to do. We're meant to tell money to be put into the gospel so we can help people, see people's lives changed, see churches built, the gospel going out all around the world. We can do these things. But money's never to be served. And when we start serving money, listen, people are to be loved. God's to be served. People are to be loved. And things are meant to be used. And we get any of those things the wrong way around, we're in trouble. Anytime we love money to use people, we're in big trouble. We always love people and use money. Now, when we started our own ministry, it started expanding and getting big. And I said, to the Lord, where's the balance? I, I want to know where the balance is. You know, I don't necessarily want a big ministry. I just want to serve you. And he said, well, son, he said, the balance is anytime you use your ministry, you use people, sorry, to grow your ministry, you've missed it. But anytime you use your ministry to grow people, that's where it's at. And I believe that for this church as well. This church, everything you see here, are really just tools to serve people and to love people. The television, the buildings, the cameras, all the equipment, everything else. You might think, do we need to spend all this money? Yes, because all these things are going to serve people and help us love people and help us reach people. So we use money as a tool. And let me tell you, money, there's no lack of money. Even right here, you might think there's a lack of money. There's no lack of money. The lack is in our minds. If we get over this, there's enough money everywhere. You know, the continent of Africa is the richest continent in the world, like by far. 
So it's not about the lack of money, it's about our thinking about money. And we need the body of Christ right here in Namibia to, to, to go, you know what, I'm believing God for prosperity. I'm believing God for extra. I'm believing God to be wealthy. I'm believing God to be rich. And the religion in you might go, ooh, that's a dangerous statement, but that's God's will for you. Jesus paid too high a price. He paid for your poverty so you don't have to have lack anymore. Amen, hallelujah. You can get rid of all lack. You can always have all sufficiency in all things. You can walk around with more than enough. Your needs met and also being able to give to every good work. Every time you see a need, you can give towards that. How many of you like to do that? How many of you like to be able to help people like that and be able to always sow into needs? Well, you're going to have to believe God for your personal prosperity. You're going to have to believe God to prosper. And the faith part of this, grace has already done it, but you remember I told you that verse? It says, and God is able. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it says, and God is able. If you back up one verse, it talks about giving. When you give, you're activating your faith for prosperity. When you give, you're saying, Lord, I believe you. I believe your word. 2 Corinthians chapter um, 9, verse 7, this is the verse that Pastor Mike read out. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly on necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You can back up another verse to verse six. This I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Guess who gets to decide the size of the harvest? We do. You get to decide the size of your harvest. When I saw this, I was like, this is awesome. It's not up to God. God wants to prosper every single person. It's up to them whether they're going to believe it or not. You see, the widow woman came and she gave two mites. Some of us give two mite offerings. You know that? Well, I might give, I might not. That's not a good attitude. We don't have a might give, might not. It depends how I feel. No, we should always be wanting to give. Amen. But she gave two mites. And Jesus called her generous. He said, you know what? This is some generous giving. Now, that was just two mites. Not a lot of money. But he called her generous. Why? Because she gave all she had. Compared to what she had, she gave generously. So the Lord showed me every single person can be generous. It doesn't matter if you're a multimillionaire or it doesn't matter if you're a single mom with no money. You can be generous. Every time there's an offering, you can be generous. And I said, Lord, how will we know? Because God is very fair. Did you know that? He set it up so that everybody can receive. If you want to, everybody can receive this promise of prosperity when you activate your faith towards it. So the Lord showed me. He said, it's very simple. He said, you give generously, you're going to receive generously. You get serious about your giving, I'll get serious about your getting. And I said, well, how will I know if my gift is generous, Lord? How will I know? And he said, well, you'll know. Your unrenewed soul will tell you. Your flesh will tell you. If your giving gets your attention, then it's getting heaven's attention. You start giving, you're like, whoo, Lord, that's a lot of money. You watch the bucket go, you're like, it's gone. You get to bed that night, you go, man, I can't believe I listened to that crazy English man. I gave that money away. You wake up in the morning like, oh, where's my Bible at? I mean, if you give to that point, if your giving is getting your attention, you're writing the check, you know, we write checks in, in America, you start shaking, you start, you're sweating as you write the check, you, you stop believing for a harvest, you just start negotiating with God for a refund. Lord, give me a refund on that seed. That's a generous gift for you. And it's all different amounts depending where you're at. It's all different amounts depending where you're at. But you can be generous there. You can trust God. You can put your faith out there and say, God, I'm trusting you. See, when we do that, when we put our faith out there and we do this, we are trusting God with our money. We're saying, God, I trust you as my source. I trust you as my provider. I trust you, Lord, and I'm putting, the, I'm putting my faith out there. You know, faith, I believe it was Pastor Mike said this as well, faith without works is dead, right? James 1, chapter 1, James chapter 2. Faith without corresponding actions is dead. So if we really believe something, we'll put action to it. If I told you I buried a million dollars in your, in your yard, in your, where you live, and you really believed me, you wouldn't even stay to the end of the sermon. You'd be out there with a shovel, a spoon, whatever you have, you're going to be digging. If you really believe that. But too many of us believe, oh yeah, well, I understand that we can give and, and, and we can receive increase. No, this is how it works. If we really believe it, we'll start giving. We'll start being rabid givers. We'll start giving to the point where we, receive, we, we feel it. And when your, when your giving gets your attention, it gets God's attention. Let me tell you, I haven't got time, but I can show you scriptures after scriptures, New Testament scriptures about how people's giving got God's attention. Mary was one of them. Cornelius, Acts 10 was another one. Their giving got God's attention. Did you know before uh, God met with, uh, with uh, Solomon, King Solomon, and said, what do you want? He just gave a massive offering. Did you know before God made a covenant with Abraham, he just gave a massive offering? When your giving gets your attention, it gets God's attention. And God's not looking for people's money. He doesn't need your money. He's looking for your heart. Matthew 6.21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you put your treasure, that's where your heart's going to be. And I'm not, I don't want to step on any toes this morning, but I could tell you what you love by what you give towards, where you spend your money. 
Where do you spend your money? Let's see where you spend your money. We can see what you love by what you spend your money on. Whatever you're passionate about, you're going to spend your money on. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, Proverbs says you can guide your heart. How do you guide your heart? You give into the kingdom of God and you'll guide your heart into the things of God. I'm telling you, this is powerful. But this is much more than money. I'm going to end with this story. This is much more, about, much more than just money. Did you know that if we don't have the right attitude with money, it can actually hinder the word of God in other areas of our life? It can hinder the word of God in other areas of our life. So in Matthew 6, 20, Matthew, the, the last part of Matthew 6 from like verse about 12 down to 35 is talking all about finances. It's talking about don't worry. It's talking about, you know, the Lord's your provider, things like that. He talks about don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. So Jesus covered the men and the women. Men always worry about what they're going to eat. What's for lunch? What's for dinner? Women always worry about what they're going to wear. What are you going to wear? <laughs> I get in trouble for that. My wife said that's sexist. But anyway, Jesus don't worry about these things. Well, in that discourse that Jesus gave teaching in Matthew 6 about money, he made a very bold statement here in Matthew 6, 24. In Matthew 6, 24, he says, you cannot. I thought we could do all things through Christ. He said, no, you cannot serve both God and mammon. He said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Either you'll be loyal to the one, despise the other, you'll love the one, or, be, or, or hate the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You know, God was showing us here that if we don't have a right attitude with money, we're going to be serving mammon instead of making mammon serve us. And let me tell you, mammon is the mask that the enemy uses to get to us. Mammon is, God, is the enemy's voice. It's trying to take us away from our relationship with God. Jesus had three temptations in Luke 4. It was mammon speaking to him. Turn this stone into bread. Jump off the pinnacle. Bow down to me. This was mammon speaking to him. Eve had mammon speaking to her. She saw it as good to the eyes, good to the sight, and able to make one wise. This was mammon speaking to her. This is mammon speaking. So what does the voice of mammon sound like? Well, Mark 4, 19, Jesus says there's three things that grow up in the ground and choke the word and make it unfruitful. Now, I don't know about you. If, I, if there's something in my life that's choking the word of God and stopping it bearing fruit, I want to know about it because I want all the good things of the word of God. I want his healing, his righteousness. His, I want everything the Lord has for me. Jesus paid too high a price to receive all. So I want to receive everything God paid for me by grace through faith. I want it all. Well, Jesus says there's three things that actually choke the word. And these three things are the voice of mammon. He says in Mark 4, 19, you know, this is the most powerful parable Jesus tells. He says, if you don't understand this parable in Mark 4, you won't understand any parables. This is how parables work. This is the Rosetta Stone of parables. This is what unlocks the other parables. This is, this is how the kingdom of God works. He says, there's three things that enter in and choke the word in your life and stop it bearing fruit. If, I, if there's things that are choking the word of God in my life, I want to know what they are so I can get rid of them. Amen. There's three things. And he says right here, these three things are the voice of mammon. He says, cares this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust for other things or covetousness. These three things enter in, choke the word, and stop it bearing fruit. He's saying, Brother Ashley, you're saying that my relationship with money or my relationship with mammon is stopping me receiving from God in other areas. Yes, it chokes the word. Mammon will choke the word. It was mammon that drove Judas to sell Jesus. It was mammon that made Martha get offended at Jesus and say, because she had cares of this world. She had to serve and had to serve and had to serve. She had cares of this world. It was mammon that made the guy build bigger barns until they were torn down. It was mammon that made the rich young ruler stop following Jesus and walk away sad because he was trusting in mammon rather than trusting in money. So we need to get to the point, church, where we're trusted in God and not mammon. And what happens is when you trust in God and not mammon, you'll start using money as a tool instead of money using you. Instead of money telling you what to do. See, if we're honest, a lot of the times we make decisions and it's based on money. How much can I afford? What job should I take? How much is it going to afford? How much is it going to pay? Where should I live? How much can I afford? What should I buy? How much can I afford? You're a restaurant. What can I eat? What can I afford? Mammon is often telling us Mammon is often the greater voice in our head than God. We need to get past that and realize that we need to tell Mammon what to do instead of Mammon telling us what to do. So I'll end this real quick story. We moved to Colorado 17 years ago nearly. And in America, everyone owns pet dogs. I don't know about here. But man, they own dogs in America. Everyone, they own dogs. They love these dogs. They have, it's embarrassing. They have doggy daycares. They have doggy hotels. Doggy spas. I'm serious. Some of these dogs, they, they anyway... So we got this little dog, and it was, it was going to grow up to be a big dog. So we got this little dog. It was a puppy, and I never owned a dog before. Well, he got some chicken bones and ran off of it, and my wife said, you've got to get that off him. It will choke him. He can't have chicken. So I went to get the chicken. I never had a dog before. I didn't know what I was doing. So I went to grab the bones from the dog, and the dog went, ah, and went for me. 
Now I'm scared of my own dog. That's embarrassing. Scared of my own puppy. So I was like, what am I going to do? So I talked to my friend. I said, I said, every time I get around my dog, it growls at me and barks at me and intimidates me and makes me scared. He said, well, that's because he thinks he's leading your, your house. See, dogs are either leading or they're being led. You hear on a Sunday morning, think, why are we learning about dog training? It's okay. It's all going to work out. Don't worry. Dogs are either leading or they're being led. There's no middle ground with dogs. And it's the same with money. Money's either leading you or you're leading it. There's no middle ground. So I had to tell this dog. He said, you've got to tell this dog who's boss. You better show this dog who's the boss of this house. How do I do that? He said, you've got to be the alpha dog. I said, I'm going to be the alpha dog. How do I do that? He said, well, next time he intimidates you and barks and growls and speaks to you, you just grab him and push him down low and make a noise and show him that you're the master. So I can do that. So next time he growled at me and everything else, I was a little scared, but I grabbed his collar, pushed him down low, and I went, bah! I was like, I'm the man. I'm the alpha dog. And his little ears went down. Well, I had to do that a number of times while he was barking at me. And then finally, he got to the point where he understood. So he'd be across the room just about to do something bad. And I'd be here, and I'd look at him. He'd look at me. I'd go, bah. <laughs> His little ears would go down. He'd trot off because now I was in charge of him. And he was following me. And he was a very happy dog for doing that. Let me tell you, we have to make mammon follow us. We have to make money our servant instead of our ruler. Amen. <laughs> and do you know what the bar is? Do you know how you do the bar when it comes to money? You give. When you give in the kingdom of God, you're saying, God, I trust you with this money. Money's not my source. Money, mammon's not my voice. Mammon's not telling me what to do, calling the shots. You, Lord, I hear your voice and yours alone. And when you do that, you give, praise God. And I'm telling you, the other things in the kingdom of God open up. Because what happens is, is that you're telling mammon what to do. You're telling money, and mammon no longer has the largest voice in your head anymore. Now you can hear God's voice more clearly. Some say, Brother Ashley, I want to hear God's voice more clearly. Start trusting him with your money. You'll hear it more clearly. I'm telling you, that's exactly how it works. When we do this, church, you'll see breakthrough in other areas. This is not about just money. This is about breakthrough in other areas, praise God. So I'm believing today that this church is going to put a bar to mammon. Stop listening to the voice of mammon and start believing the promises of God that God wants you rich. You heard me. That'll get rid of all religion right there. God, just like he wants you righteous or has made you righteous, just like he's made you healed and healthy, he's made you rich. The question is, are you going to choose to believe it? Are you going to choose to say, hey, I volunteer for the program. I choose to be rich for the Lord so I can give to this church and see the kingdom expand. I choose to be rich, praise God, so we can be debt free and we can help more people. I choose to be rich. The Lord is looking for people to say, yes, Lord, I believe it. I receive it. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Who, who wants that promise? Who wants to activate that promise by faith? And say, Lord, I want to activate that promise by faith, Lord. I repent. I repent of, of seeing things wrong. And right now, Lord, we, put the, we say bar to mammon. And Lord, we, we want to sign up for the program. If that's you, stand to your feet right now. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you right now for breakthrough. This is supernatural increase, supernatural abundant increase. God can do it in any, for any person, whatever age, Whatever education you have, whatever color you are, whatever country you're from, whatever your family line is from, God can do this for anybody, anywhere, any place. Why? Because it's the Word of God, and the Word never returns void. He's given us a promise. Jesus has taken our lack and our poverty to the cross. We should hate lack. We should hate poverty. We should hate not having enough, just like we hate sin, just like we hate sickness. We should say no more poverty, no more lack, no more not enough. Every time you want to be generous and you can't, you need to get mad and say, Lord, I, I believe in you to be able to be more generous. I'm believing you to be able to give more. I'm believing you to be able to help more people. So right now, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your promise of prosperity. I thank you for your, your promise. You took poverty to the cross, Lord, so that we could be made rich. And right now, I speak to every person standing, every person online, every person believing in this promise, Lord. We activate our faith today. Lord, we repent of not listening correctly. We repent of, of judging people. We repent, Lord, of covetousness, myself included. We repent, Lord, of cares this world and deceitfulness of riches. And Lord, right now, we trust you and you alone. We say, Lord, you own it all anyway. These are all yours. This is all yours, Lord. You, this is your money. We're yours. You bought us at price. So right now, Lord, we turn over to you and say, Lord, you have control of our finances. You be the Lord of our lives, including our finances, including our bank accounts. Right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. We're making you the Lord of our lives, every area. The Lord of our marriages, the Lord of our children, and the Lord of our bank accounts, in Jesus' name. I thank you for supernatural increase right now. Every business owner here, for supernatural increase, breakthrough, new contracts, new customers, witty inventions, new ways of doing things, supernatural solutions. I thank you for prosperity flowing through this place, for this church to be prosperous like never before, completely debt-free, having everything they need to do to build everything they believe to build, to help all the people they want to help, in Jesus' name, more than enough, more than enough 
for you. I'm believing the day when Pastor Mike will say, stop giving, we've got too much. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for more than enough. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, we are stretching. I thank you, Lord, we are stretching these 10 pegs. Isaiah says, stretch out these 10 pegs. Stretch out these 10 pegs. Broaden your, uh, your uh, tent. Broaden your occupancy. We're going we're gonna to stretch ourselves, Lord, by faith. And as we stretch ourselves by faith, we're able to receive more of what you have for us. So right now, in Jesus' name, I thank you for supernatural abundance right now. Supernatural abundance right now of everybody. Listen to my voice right now in Jesus' name. Breakthrough. We curse poverty, we curse lack. We thank you as you paid the price for it. And right now I speak abundance. Supernatural increase. Super, everything we put our hands to is blessed in Jesus' name. I thank you. We're going to get testimonies tonight of blessings coming on people in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Everyone say amen. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hey, we pray you were blessed by that message. Hey, if you want to partner with us, connect with us, all the information is coming down on the screen below me where you can click, get connected uh, to, with this ministry, with our ministry, Experience Core Global. And don't forget, hit the subscribe button so you can get alerted every time we have new content coming up here on our YouTube page. Thank you for your support. And remember, where you are now is the lowest you will ever be.